Well, hello there, Choralosophers. Welcome to a Choralosophy podcast segment called Choir Director Problems. I've made a few of these kind of irregularly throughout the first couple of years of the show, just whenever the mood strikes me, and I decided to uh, switch things around. I'm having a little bit of writer's block with this, uh, the way I want to discuss this with you. So I'm sitting on my couch rather than at my desk, feeling like I need to just be looking at things from a different perspective. Because one of the things that I've noticed of late uh, is that I am feeling more and more frustrated with online teaching. My personal life situation has kind of been like many of yours. There's a mixture of the things I've been asked to do this year as a teacher, and some virtual, some in person, some hybrid, some just a little bit of everything. And one of the things that I've noticed Uh, is that with the virtual instruction, a lot of what is being discussed by uh, my colleagues and the way we tend to, as a teaching profession, discuss what's going on right now is that, as I see it, it seems to be a little bit of a rose-colored glasses instinct that we are using to discuss what's going on with virtual instruction. When I see the comments in Facebook groups when a teacher will come in and rarely and just express a frustration and just a a despair almost uh, with the way virtual instruction is going for them. They inevitably will see something about like, yes, this is, but this is for the best. And uh, you know, we have to stay safe and they're, you know, this will pass Right, all these things that we typically see, and I don't necessarily disagree with any of those things, but when I say rose-colored glasses, I almost it, I sense a hesitancy from teachers, and this is beyond just choir. Right? This is beyond the, the entire field of education right now. We don't want to discuss the failures of virtual school. We just don't want to discuss it. We want to talk about how it, we're doing the best with, with what we can and everyone needs to give each other grace and give the students grace and all of that. And, and yes, of course, but I feel like why can't we give each other grace while also acknowledging that we're failing kids? We're, we are failing them in terms of what our core mission is, which is to educate them. And you could say that, uh, you know, that what's the point of acknowledging that if there's nothing we can do, right? And my, my response to that would be, you always acknowledge it if it's true. It doesn't, whether you can fix it or not, you, you acknowledge it. And so what I think is important about this as, as the way I think about this is that it's not an anti-teacher position to, to hold that we as an education profession are not delivering education that is adequate for our kids. And my evidence for that would be the rate of kids that are failing classes across the country right now, uh, more than it's ever been. Kids that are failing a class now that have never failed a class in their lives. Kids that are uh, in a feeling of despair and disengagement from school, not even failing a class because they're not understanding the content. They're failing the class because they're just not even showing up for the virtual modules. It's easy for us to point out, and I'm probably going to do that with you guys, point out some of the more successful things that I've done with my virtual kids, but that all assumes that they're the ones that are showing up. There's a good portion of my kids, by the way, kids that I love, that just don't show up. They, they don't engage with any of the virtual content, and that causes me to feel a sense of despair a sense of inadequacy. I can't reach that kid. I can't even get them to write me back in an email. Can't get them to show up to the Google Meet. Can't. Doesn't matter how easy I make the content. Doesn't matter how change. How many times I change it up and try to do different stuff. Some percentage of the kids are just not engaged. And of course, that's predictable. Like we knew this was going to happen. It happened it back in March when we shut things down the first time. And this is happening all over the country, and there are there places, and there are teachers that are doing better than others, and some are doing a, a better job of engaging, and maybe uh, some schools have a better system for keeping kids engaged. But ultimately, where I'm concerned with this topic 
is that I have students that can't do their own work because they're the oldest of five kids and mom and dad are at work and that means that they're in charge when they're at home and in order for their third grade little brother to do their work they they have to supervise that which means high school goes out the window for that kid you know this is happening all over the country and not to mention kids who are taking psych meds for the first time in their life kids who are suicidal for the first time in their life this is all really happening and that's not a political statement. And what's sad about that is that it has become one. It has become a political position that teachers hold. Some, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it, please. But that some hold that makes it hard for us to discuss how the virtual school experiment that we are undergoing is failing kids. And it shouldn't, if you find it hard to discuss a thing, my, my suggestion would be that your first instinct is check your own self and ask yourself why. Because what I feel like we're living in right now, and it's been a, a long time coming for the last several years, is we've evolved into a world that cares first, not whether something's true, but whether or not it benefits their position. And it's a, that's a political criticism, right? That we, if it doesn't benefit our side... Then, it's, then we just won't discuss it. And that's, that I've been seeing that from the very beginning on this whole topic. And here's, here's, the, here's how I'll boil this down. If your position is that school is too dangerous for teachers to go into a, in person, and you support that position, school should stay closed until transmission's lower, until you're vaccinated, whatever it is, I'm not going to judge you for that. I, I disagree. I, I've seen enough information presented here on this show that, and talked to enough doctors to where I understand the risk pretty well, and I, I'm comfortable with taking on a risk of, of going into school because I feel that, m that my students need me. I, I, I feel like I matter to them, and I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go take that risk because I think the benefit outweighs the risk. But if you're on the other side of that that equation, I, I'm, I'm cool with you. Like, I, I get it. But what I don't get is the unwillingness to talk about all of it, right? And that's what we do here on the Coralosophy podcast on every topic. There's no, we're going to talk about all of it. And that means if, if there are safety issues that need to be addressed in a school, we should talk about those. We should have this building closed down or this building closed down and talk very uh, frankly with your leadership about that, and teachers should be brought to the table and have be able to express their concerns. All of that should be happening. But on the other side, too, we should be willing to talk about student-centered outcomes. Not just teacher safety. Student-centered outcomes. What are we doing to the kids? Not only now and the despair that they're feeling now, but what, what are we doing to them 10 years from now? by taking experiences from them that are, keep in mind, guys, our students are in their formative years, even those of us who teach college level. There is, there is quite a bit of formation of future humanity that is going on here. And for us to just bury our head in the sand and not talk about it, not be willing to discuss it without demonizing the person who disagrees with us, is, is a dereliction, dereliction of our duty. I dare say, a dereliction of our duty. Our duty is to educate. And, and if we can't even have a conversation as a profession regarding this topic, like what is, what is actually happening to our kids? I've had students tell me that I'm the only teacher that they have who doesn't get mad at them when they vent about online school. When, when they talk about how stressed they are, when they talk about how they're not learning anything, when they talk about how they can click the right buttons like a mouse in a trap, to get the assignment to go through, they're not learning anything. They're, they're, they're literally checking boxes to get a grade. Now, you know, I'm like I, like I said before, this is not an anti-teacher thing. It just isn't. I'm working my butt off. I'm creating, trying to create new things all the time for us to do in a virtual environment. I'm trying to figure out ways to get them to show up, uh, in ways to engage, 
the, if the assignment's too hard, they won't do it. If it's too easy, it's boring, right? Where, where do we figure out how to get the kids to come in? Now, I know, I know what I can do if they're in the classroom, right? I, I know what I can do. And like I said before, I'm willing to take that risk. I respect teachers who aren't, okay? I respect that. I, I continue to be frustrated, though, of just the, lack, the general lack of conversation on all sides of this. Like if you, if you don't fall down on the right side, then you're expelled from the conversation. You're expelled from the fraternity that is teachers. Now, I think one of the things that, um, if I allow myself to say, that I bring to the table is that I disagree with all of you about everything. I just, like, that's, that's my Enneagram, eight wing seven. <laughs> I disagree with everyone about everything all the time. But what's interesting is I do it, I'm so used to that, like it's been my whole life. I'm so used to that, that I, I've learned to disagree with everyone about everything while still loving them intensely. Right? I, I, can, I can separate that in my mind. I can look at somebody who holds vastly different views than I do, and I, I can put that in its little box. And there's your views on that box, and, and then, hey, let's go have a drink. Right. And I'll, and, and for the people who know me, they know that that is true. Like I, I can, I could be (laughs) quite angry with someone in the context of a conversation of where we don't agree. And as soon as that conversation's over, it's as if it never happened. It just, I move on. I'm not going to hold a grudge. So when I say this to this little vent, I guess, of a choir director problem that I'm seeing, is that I want us to discuss these things in their totality, in their full, ugly color, okay? Virtual school is hurting kids. For anyone to deny that, I think at this point, is just a head buried in the sand. Of course it's hurting kids. They are suffering. They are feeling despair. They're not learning like they used to, are teachers doing their best to, to do what they can with what they have? Yes, absolutely. We are working our butts off. But what does that mean for the kids? Just because we're working hard doesn't mean they're learning. Those two things are not necessarily correlated, right? I can be working 14 hours in a day to try to make the virtual modules, but if 20% of my kids don't show up for that lesson, I'm working harder than the benefit that I'm getting back. And that is what's happening as I see it. Now, are there exceptions? And somebody could be listening to this, watching this, and say, but that's not how it is in my experience. Fine. But I've talked to enough people and seen enough conversations online and had this experience myself now enough times to know that this is going on. We do have kids that are suffering, and I sure hope, I sure hope all of you that are listening to this are the teacher for your kids that can that they can reach out to and say i am struggling with school i can't make myself do it i can't make myself show up what do i do they need somebody that they can talk to about this because what i've what i've experienced what i've been seeing is that the longer this goes on the more and more kids just drop off my radar they won't respond i can't help them it's like i'm seeing uh, them i can see them on the other end of the computer, I can see that their grade is sitting there or their name is sitting there on my roster. Haven't checked in, haven't responded. So I, I know they're struggling because these would be kids that in a normal environment would be high-fiving me on the way in and out of the, the room. Right? These are awesome kids. They are awesome kids. So I can see that they're struggling because they're not engaged. But since I can't put them in my classroom and make eye contact with them, I can't help them. So I I can't continue to play this charade that virtual school will just, you know, we're just doing the best we can and that's all we can. No, no, we are doing the best that we can, but that's not all that we can do. We can decide that when we get the opportunity to jump in the game, 
we can recognize our ability to do that and our ability to do it safely. The safety precautions that, we, that schools are putting in place, most places are awesome. And my goodness, we, those of us who've been teaching in school, many of you that are listening are teaching every day in, in person. There are places that are doing it, right? And so that means it can be done. It means it can be done. And, and that means, too, that when I'm not teaching in person, oftentimes that means I'm isolated from risks that my students are taking on when they go to their jobs. And almost all of my students' parents are taking on those risks when they go to their jobs. My issue is why am I special? Why am I special? I have a job to do, too. I have... I have a value to society, and I believe that about what I do. I know you all do too, but I fail to see why I should be isolated from the risks while my kids aren't and their parents aren't. We're all in this together. We keep hearing that, right? We're all in this together. I want a chance to be in it with them. That means that I take on some risk, more, way more risk than the kids, as the scientific consensus is clear on that now. It is not a guess. The age discrepancy for this risk is huge. It's one of the weirdest things about the virus. It's huge, way more than flu. The, the disparity in how, the, how this affects age groups is way more than other viruses and, and things that we know about. You can feel free to go back to all the expert interviews that I've done on the show. That, that is a real thing. So that means I, I know that by walking into the classroom, I'm going to take on more risk than the kids, on average, on average. But this is now just me speaking for me. I'm willing. I'm willing to do it. And I, I really hope I get the chance. Thank you. Thank you very much for enduring that little rant. As I said a minute ago, I respect all of you. And I continue to make the pledge that on this show I will be honest and I will be forthright. And if you appreciate that and decide to um, share this content or share any of the content, I always appreciate it. Uh, it I can take the disagreement, uh, I, but I think that the point is that if we don't have conversations, if we don't have real authentic conversations, then we never really get to the bottom of anything. We don't solve anything. And so I want to offer that, uh, that I'm, this, I'm struggling. I am really feeling lost. And I think that it's because I'm help, being held back from my own potential as a teacher. Because what I, the reason I do this is because I love to help kids. I love to help kids figure out that they're powerful. Help them discover the things about themselves that I already knew were true. And in this virtual environment, I just, I, I'm not figuring out how to do it. I'm trying, you guys. I'm not giving up on this. I'm just, it's just hard. It's hard. And I wanted to voice that so that you knew if somebody, somebody out there listening is also feeling like this is hard and feeling the despair and feeling like they're not living up to their potential, that someone else is feeling that way too. So thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, don't forget, uh, share, like, subscribe send episodes around, go to the website coralosophy.com and sign up for the mailing list. That way you make sure you don't miss anything that's coming up. I'll send, a ma uh, send an email every couple months, just giving you a review of what's happened on the show. And of course, hit up those sponsors and use that promo code. That helps me a lot. Uh, that's why they know that you're listening. And uh, that's how I support the show is by you choosing to either uh, use a promo code for one of those awesome sponsors, Voce Vista, Dot com forward slash Coralosophy for that overtone software uh, at Sight Reading Factory, Graphite Publishing, Ryan Main, My Music Folders. Uh, all of these websites are just awesome and they, they help you out and you, you get that discount and it helps me out. So thank you so much. And of course, Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy is also a big deal. Uh, just gives you a chance to uh, drop, a, you know, three bucks my way every every month to help me underwrite the costs of the show as they continue to mount. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you next time.